Good morning. This is Wendy Downing, pastor of the Steelville Presbyterian Church. We continue our sermon series on the rebel Jesus with a sermon entitled, The Most Important Question You Will Ever Have to Answer, based on Luke 9, verses 18 through 20. Let us pray. O loving God, Scripture tells us of your desire that we choose the way of the truly good life, and we gather here to worship you, for you are our provider, the one who cares for us enough to teach us how we are to live our own highest good and the highest good of society. We are grateful, O God, that through Moses you not only gave us the commandments which led to life, but exemplified and fulfilled them in Jesus, whose life of obedience meant the cross. Grant us the grace to understand how great is the gift of love you have given to us as to Israel, and grant us the grace to learn the wisdom in living your way. Amen. Luke 9, 18 through 20. <clears throat> Once when Jesus was praying alone with only the disciples near him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, that one of the ancient prophets has arisen. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Messiah of God. May God add a blessing to the reading of the word. Today we continue our sermon series on the renegade gospel. Week, week one we talked about discovering the rebel Jesus. And last week we talked about a revolutionary lifestyle. Today we will be asked the most important question of our lives. A media producer for a mega church went to get some on the street footage for worship and asked people in Dayton, Ohio, who is Jesus? Here are some of the answers he got. Oh boy, um, a man who lived long ago and he gave, um, what is it he gave? He gave us life for our sins. There are all kinds of fables out there. Some have been proven, some haven't. The Son of God. Jesus was a good guy. He was trying to do good, but he was just an ordinary man. I don't believe that he is God. I don't believe that he floats around like a ghost or something. Oh, I don't want to answer that question. He was a good teacher and a prophet. Oh, Lord. The question made many of the responders uncomfortable. Jesus himself asked the same question of his disciples, and Peter answered, the Christ sent from God. When Jesus asked this critical question of the disciples, they had been traveling with him, eating with him, sleeping where he slept, witnessing miracles and doing extraordinary feats themselves for 18 months. Yet the disciples were still held accountable by Jesus for making a decision about Jesus' identity. No other single individual has had more impact on history than Jesus. The calendar system itself proclaims that to be true. We date time by Jesus' life. Yet Jesus' divinity has remained controversial throughout the ages. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, addressed the issue of Jesus' divinity in this way. A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. Lewis believes we only have three choices. The first choice is that Jesus is a liar, which does not match the high moral integrity of Jesus' teachings or his way of life. 
The second choice is that Jesus was a lunatic. If you've ever been to a psychiatric unit and met people who claim to be Jesus or God, you would quickly observe that their character was in no way consistent with the character demonstrated in Jesus' life. The third choice is that Jesus was who he claimed to be, Lord. As Lewis put it, Jesus is a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. He left little room for any other conclusion to be drawn. The process of acquiring faith is typically a gradual and progressive endeavor. Real faith is not quick. Faith is not that easy. Remember that Jesus did not pose the essential question of his identity to his disciples until they had been traveling with him day and night for 18 months. Growing in faith is not just progressive in nature. It also happens best within the context of community. Luke 9, 1 through 2 says, When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Active faith in Jesus is not a solitary sport. It is difficult to discover the divinity of Jesus or the power of Jesus by yourself. Instead, Jesus is revealed in community. When we are part of a community and committed to that community, we experience power that we don't possess when alone. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus describes himself as the source of life, the vine that makes the branches possible. Note that branches is plural. When we as a community are intertwined with one another and connected to Jesus as Lord, we bear much fruit. Without Jesus, without that connectedness, we can do nothing. The scripture that I read this morning follows immediately after the story of Jesus feeding 5,000 households with five loaves and two fish. Slaughter then tells of his own story of Jesus multiplying resources when we work together in community. His church took up their first annual Christmas miracle offering in 2005. It's a big church, and through the years, they have raised more than $7 million of humanitarian investment into the Sudan and South Sudan, used to initiate a sustainable agricultural program in, in Darfur. Their first offering put 5,209 households back into the farming business and provided the income for families to buy back 900 of their children from indentured servanthood. Slaughter says he experienced the miracle of multiplication when he visited Darfur. 5,209 families helped remind him of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus promised in John 14, 12. Very truly I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things be than these, because I am going to the Father. In the biblical account of the feeding of the 5,000, and in Slaughter's experience in 2005, Jesus' div divinity wasn't felt because he snapped his fingers and conjured provisions out of thin air. Instead, he invited the gathered community to be part of the multiplication miracle when we faithfully pull our and release our resources into Jesus' hands. Regardless of how we reach our response to Jesus' key question, much more is re required than simply answering, you are the Christ sent from God. Responding effectively to that question means a whole life commitment. It means acknowledging and fully embracing what Jesus was as a man and who he is as divine God. Jesus is the best picture we could ever imagine of a God we would want to follow. In human form, Jesus demonstrated that God is not an unconcerned, disembodied entity who is emotionally detached from our pain and suffering, but rather a God who chooses to enter into that suffering with us. 
Jesus gives flesh and reality to a God who cares, loves us deeply, and longs to win us at all costs, even to the point of death on a cross. Right after Jesus asked the key question, who do you say that I am? Jesus shared what could only have been a difficult concept for, to embrace for the disciples. All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will save them. The operative word here is daily. A disciple must die to self and rise to new life in Christ each day after accepting Jesus Christ as Lord. Unfortunately, says Slaughter, many of us start that journey with enthusiasm but fail to sustain it. Our faith goes on cruise control as we start seeking comfort and not a calling. It doesn't help that too often in our churches we pigeonhole Jesus safely behind the altar rails and communion tables of our tame religious traditions, teaching people to revere Jesus instead of following Jesus sacrificially every day in the trenches of life. Jesus' call is not to revere. His call is to follow. When we truly follow, reverence will naturally result. We struggle to follow Jesus in part because our contemporary culture is saturated with a secular worldview. In this worldview, we operate as if God were not a factor. Jesus becomes a Sunday morning habit, and the rest of the week we seem to get along just fine without him. A secular worldview is also a materialistic worldview. We draw our security from our money and material possessions rather than from our promises of God. Within our soft, secular churches, we claim to believe in God and profess Jesus, but then act on the values of the secular culture. Tithing is one example. Slaughter says that his church is healthy in terms of stewardship and generous giving, and yet even at his church there are hundreds of families in the church who give nothing. Christians have brought Jesus into the secular worldview instead of bringing the secular world into Jesus' worldview. If we're going to follow Jesus, recognizing Jesus as Messiah, we will have to radically realign our life priorities. Jesus demonstrated this with a parable found in Luke 14. A man representing God hosts a dinner party and sends his servants out to invite guests to the party. They use the same excuses we use today. Our material property, our work, our relationships. These convenient excuses betray our real alliances and show that we relegate Jesus to someone we worship at church one morning a week. What has happened to the practice of following Jesus sacrificially? Each of us in our lifetime will answer Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? Let's not deceive ourselves. Not answering, ignoring, avoiding, belittling, or postponing the question is still a response. I have been traveling with Jesus for 63 years now and have never been completely free of doubt. In many ways, I am still figuring this Jesus journey out. Yet despite periodic fear, failure, and setbacks, I can proclaim like Peter that the rebel Jesus is the Christ sent from God. Jesus has repeatedly revealed himself to me as Messiah and Lord when I have responded in faith to his call, witnessing the miracle of multiplication through the community of God's people as we place our resources, gifts, and lives into his hands. Who is Jesus? One of the church's most ancient creeds, the Apostles' Creed, proclaims the foundation on which I have staked my reputation, my ministry, and my life. Let us stand and proclaim it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.